Welcome to the Maximize Business Value Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their business on their terms. Our mission was born from the lessons we've learned from over 100 business transactions, which fuels our desire to share our experiences and wisdom so you can succeed. Now here's your host, CEO of Mastery Partners, Tom Bronson. Hi, this is Tom Bronson, and welcome back to Maximize Business Value, a podcast for business owners who are passionate about building long-term sustainable value in their businesses. So in this episode, I'd like to welcome our guest, Cleve Clinton, who is a partner at Gray Reed Law Firm in Dallas. I met Cleve through a mutual friend several years ago, and we've become great friends. He has presented at our V90X Lunch and Learn series, of course, pre-COVID. We hope to relaunch that again soon. And I learned that he is a master storyteller who, as a corporate attorney with a broad spectrum of clients, has been there, done that in almost every legal situation I could imagine. As Cleve says, he represents Mavericks who dare big, plan big, think big, and get into big trouble. I love that. Today, we're going to talk about some of the legal considerations that business owners should really be thinking about related to long-term value and ultimately transitioning their business. Welcome to Maximize Business Value, Cleve. How are you today? Thanks, Tom. Doing great. A little soggy outside, but nice and warm and toasty inside. Exactly. So tell us a little bit about yourself and Gray Reed. I've been with Gray Reed for over 20 years. We're a, as everybody else seems to say, a full service law firm. Perhaps one of our distinctions is we've been one of the regularly best places to work in Dallas. And as one of my partners has often said, contented cows give good milk. And as a result of that, we not only are we great lawyers, but we provide, we're happy, we're contented, we provide good services to our clients for a wide, wide range of services. Mine happens to be, I'm a board certified civil trial lawyer who has over the years discovered that most of my clients are Mavericks and those folks, uh, they don't much care for lawyers and they certainly uh, hate the courthouse. As a consequence, my job over the last multiple years has been, how do I figure out a way to either get them out of the courthouse successfully and efficiently or uh, how do I uh, keep them from getting to the courthouse in the first place? That's that's awesome. So, you know, as you as you mentioned that, I know you're a, a certified trial lawyer, but a popular misperception among business leaders is that kind of all attorneys are the same. Um, yeah, I I really couldn't uh, disagree with that anymore completely uh, because I think attorneys, kind of like doctors, are specialists. You wouldn't go to a brain surgeon if you have a foot problem. But I see that all the time with clients. As an example, you know, when I ask them their relationship with their, with their attorney, they'll say, oh, I've got a great attorney. He handles all my stuff. Well, what did he do for you recently? Oh, he, was a, he, he really handles all of my real estate stuff. Well, that might be a real estate specialist. I, I always say that you need to have kind of a general counsel uh, type of an attorney at the top. So you gave us a little bit, but why? You know, you're even though you're a trial attorney, why are you kind of focused on being a general counsel? I enjoy understanding my client's business and I enjoy the relationship of ha- having a long term relationship with the client. The, it, the uh, experience and the understanding of their business that provides permits long term relationship. In frequently, uh, I'll find that my understanding of their business gives them insight sometimes that they never would have had themselves. As I was telling my wife recently, in fact, maybe this morning, I, I said, you know, a lot of folks will say I need to build a house. So I guess I need to hire an electrician, a plumber, a concrete man, and an attorney to look over my documents. Now, that's a transactional relationship. And customarily, I'm not the guy that does only transactional relationships. I've got guys in my office that handle that. I got real estate experts. I got construction experts and so forth. So mine's a relational and it's more of a general counsel relationship. And it's evolved into that because of the Mavericks that I represent that have a variety of problems themselves. No doubt. You know, I I can vouch for that. I know that uh, as you've been a a regular attendee and a speaker at our uh, V90X uh, Lunch and Learn, uh, Cleve has great long-term relationships with lots of his clients. And uh, so I can confirm that. So 
I'm frequently asked to make a presentation that I, that I give regularly on 50 things you can do to maximize the value of your business. We're going to dive into some of those things today. One of the things that I talk about, uh, and in fact, one of the first questions I ask our clients when we engage with them is, are your corporate records in order? And look, nobody's corporate records in order, or very few companies' corporate records are up to date. We think you should review your corporate documents regularly and think about having an attorney do it for you. Do you agree with that and why? Well, obviously it's a nice softball question, so I'd have to agree with you, of course. But beyond that, I mean, many people feel like that it's just a matter of corporate formalities would be a common phrase that you might hear. And that would be okay to not be worried about corporate formalities and go to Google and let Mr. Google provide your answer to your, your uh, annual meetings. But if you've got, if there's more in your business than you, and if you've got a banker who frequently wants to know if you met, if you uh, followed all your corporate formalities, or if you've got an accountant who would like to help you do an audit and you need an audit for some reason, or, or recently, if you've got a loan with a banker and you've got a PPP loan, at some point, a PPP loan is going to require a whole lot of conversation and a whole lot of a demonstration of satisfying the underlying criteria. And that's something that some accountants can do, perhaps some uh, CPAs and some uh, CFOs of companies can do. But by and large, you're going to want to make sure that you've satisfied the criteria. And frequently, that's going to be apparent that you've had meetings and you've talked to your board of directors or you've talked to your members, your owners of your company, your partners, your shareholders, whatever. It's going to be apparent from your minutes that you discussed the issues that should have been discussed to satisfy the requirements to be uh, to have your PPP loan forgiven. That just happens to be a good look, good current example of that. Oh, that's a, that's a great example. You know, another thing that uh, frequently comes up uh, is when they say, well, uh, you know, we don't really have shareholder meeting, you know, we don't have our, our, um, uh, any board meetings, we don't have a board, we don't have any board minutes. And I say, but what about corporate resolutions? And they say, well, we don't really have any of those. And I say, well, do you have a loan from the bank? Well, yeah, I do have a loan. Well, I promise you in those closing documents, there was a corporate resolution that had to be signed. And so if, <laughs> so that probably belongs in your corporate records, right? I mean, you know, most people don't realize that they actually do have resolutions that may have been uh, thrust upon them. To me, it's about when, especially at time for a transition, a, uh, a corporation that has all of their corporate documents and records in order, in the right place, you know, in the book, so to speak, if you have a book, and a lot of people do that electronically now. Uh, but that's one of the first places a buyer does due diligence is on corporate records. And if your corporate records are in order, that sets up uh, a due diligence to go a lot smoother than if they're a mess, if there are things missing, if there are things not there. So, so I love now. Now, it also, I guess your corporate records that you need to keep depend on the type of uh, entity status that you have. I mean, the, the C Corps and S Corps and LLCs have different uh, requirements for the records that they need to keep. By and large, the minutes are a set of documents that just reflect what, they, what was talked about. Not an excruciating, painful detail, but just topical. I mean, for example, I represent several families and those families will periodically complain that they're not getting all the information. They don't know what's going on. They don't, they don't understand what's, what's happening with the business. Did we get a PPP loan? What does that mean? And how does that affect us? Are we going to be, is it going to be satisfied? They read the paper, they, they listen to the news and it creates a lot of questions and issues. So I've encouraged the executive committee of an LLC that I represent to write when they have their meetings every couple of weeks, to put in their executive committee minutes, formalized minutes, information that is that uh, one of the members of the family would want to have answers to, so that any family member at any point can go to the secure company website and look at the EC minutes from the last year or two years. 
being able to read the minutes and along with the minutes, you see the financials, you see the reports on what's been going, going on in various warehouses. Again, it's not an excruciating detail, but it is a communication methodology that allows everybody to know what's going on and for the officers to be able to see, to say, there's no excuse for you to not know what's going on. Right. Because all you got to just pick up the EC minutes and have a look. Right. And it's so much easier to keep up with, you know, as you're going along, as opposed to trying to make those up, you know, five years later, right. And, and try and figure out how to put that in so much easier. Uh, try to, the business or the bank is asking for proof. Yes. I tried, tried to convince my kids that it was easier to clean up their room as they go, but you know how that works out too. So, uh, so uh, speaking of examining things, corporate records, we think business owners should, should think about examining their entity status as well. So C-Corps, S-Corps, LLCs, partnerships, things like that. We think that you should examine that on, a, on at least some sort of a routine basis. Um, my own example of that is we were, in my last company, we were an S-Corp and we took on a non-qualifying shareholder as an S-Corp and we automatically defaulted to a C-Corp which caused us some tax issues at transition uh, later that we should have addressed. But why is it important then? And, and how can you help your clients to, to kind of examine that on a routine basis? Your question, your, the example you gave is perfect and it happens altogether too often. Uh, it's not uncommon for dad to start a proprietorship and he's got, it's, it's basically just dad, doing business and maybe someday it becomes dad and sons and then he gets a hold of a lawyer and a lawyer says you need to form a limited partnership so he forms a general partner and a limited partnership general partner corporate whatever then texas imposes franchise taxes and says oh you're gonna have to pay franchise taxes unless you are a a, a bigger part it starts off as a corp unless you're a limited partnership and so then it goes to a limited partnership then a limited partnership really has got limitations on it for the kinds for some kinds of businesses and doesn't allow the kind of growth and numbers of owners sometimes that an LLC can better accommodate. The beauty I think of an LLC is you've got a company agreement, which is just a nice big contract that's between all the owners that says, this is how we're gonna work with each other. This is how we're gonna plan for officers and directors. And this is how we're gonna conduct our business. That all that periodically that'll change, and then the tax situations change, as it has happened with the last administration, and very well may happen again with the next administration. So having somebody look at that, sometimes an accountant's going to do a pretty good job of putting you on notice. Hey, you need to look at this, but there's other reasons to look at your tax status, and we'll talk about it. I suspect in a minute about consolidating businesses. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the things you know, as we as we talked about, you mentioned the the, the family uh, shareholders and whatnot, and and sometimes you have outside non non employee shareholders, uh, outside investors. Um, one of the things that that we like to advise clients is if if their cap table is getting kind of um, out of hand, if they've got lots and lots of shareholders, that they should think about consolidating ownership as much as possible, uh, potentially buying out shareholders or combining or, or doing some things like that. Do you think that that's something important that the business owners should examine? Absolutely. Particularly, for example, as I recall, there's a hundred member cap on an LLC, which may uh -huh. be outside of the numbers you're talking about. But if you go over that number, then that creates problems. Certain businesses don't permit you to have owners who are less than 21 years of age. For example, alcohol and the beer business has, has those issues. Or if one of your members is, convic uh, is convicted of a felony, uh, that can be problematic to your license, ultimately your, your ownership of your license. And so knowing those, the answers to those questions, but ultimately the, the example that you posed strikes me as being most problematic when it comes to having thoughtful decision-making at the top that's strategically driven and tactically successful. And, some, and the more people you have without having a system in place to periodically and thoughtfully elect the right people to be in charge can be very problematic. 
Oh, totally, totally agree. Totally agree. And that's another reason, although we didn't really uh, uh, talk about this earlier, but that's another great reason to have an operating agreement. Uh, so, so we know who's making decisions, right? Uh, so, so another sort of a corollary to, to, um, to consolidating ownership is, is addressing and institutionalizing lurking family and or shareholder issues. So um, uh, I've, I've talked about uh, before a couple of examples of that where, where there are children that are, that are not in the business, but they're being paid uh, from the business, that kind of thing. Have, have you run into that kind of thing and, and has it caused some challenges? And, and if it's left unaddressed, how can it impact the business? Well, it's almost certainly a problem. Frequently uh, first uh, initiated by the solo owner and perhaps his wife or the solo owner and perhaps her husband. In either way, um, the, the thought can often be, well, gee, we've got this great company. We'll just make them employees and we'll give them all medical insurance after they turn 25. And that, that way they've all got health insurance and they've, they've got a good group plan under the company umbrella. Uh, or we may give them cell phone or we may give them a little bit of spending money. We'll call them employees to make it spending money. Well, if you're planning on the business selling or going away after the owner dies, male or female, then you can almost imagine that there's going to be a fight that's going to take place between those who are like Henny Penny, those who are making the bread and those who are eating the bread. And the, 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 it's almost certainly going to be a problem. And it's one that if you don't deal with now, uh, it'll be a catastrophe later. Yeah, I, I, I totally are, agree. Examples, yeah. Yeah. So let's switch gears for a second and talk a little bit about legal agreements, right? And things that, that you should have. We often uh, tell our clients that they need to have buy-sell agreements with their shareholders and or partners. Why is that important? And, and why should, if they don't have it already and they've got partners or shareholders in the business, why should they have something like that? Well, if there's only two of you, a buy-sell agreement is critical. And frequently, my, my favorite would be kind of the, with the shotgun buy sell agreement. Sometimes it's called, or I like to think of it as one of you gets to gets to cut the, this pig, big uncut pie, and the other one gets to pick which piece they want. Frequently done with one of you picks the number, the other one gets to decide if I want to push or pull, buy or sell on that number, whatever it may be. If there's two of you, that's almost I, I can't imagine any other way short of really painful litigation to get out of that kind of an arrangement. If there's more than two people, or there's certainly an, an odd number, then a buy-sell agreement makes sense. It's not quite as necessary, but what is important about it is having an orderly way to dispose of uh, ownership. For example, in an LLC, it's not uncommon to provide that only a lineal descendant can be the beneficiary of a member's interest. The value of that, if it's not obvious, would be you, you not, may not necessarily choose to have your family as, as your partners, but you almost certainly would may not want to have your in-laws as partners. And if, one, if you, a family member dies, then you can be, uh, have the opportunity to deal with a, a, an in-law who knows little or nothing about the business as your partner. That's when you want to either you want to provide in your in your operating agreement, your company agreement, that is, that a that it must go to a lineal descendant, and if it doesn't, then the part then the company's got the right to buy out the non-lineal descendant so that they're not going to be a voting member of the partnership of the limited liability company or the partnership, uh, or you have some other arrangement by which you can uh, you can address in a non-litigious fashion, the, the problem of dealing with people who otherwise are not going to be able to get along and the company's going to suffer, the business will suffer. Right, right, right. So, um, you know, it occurs to me as you, as you mentioned that, so the company may have the right in a buy-sell to, to uh, buy the shares back. Um, is it, you know, in that case, you might wind up having to get a, a certified business valuation or something. Is it possible to avoid that by agreeing to a valuation methodology uh, upfront when you sign the agreement? 
Sure. You can, there, and there's a number of ways you can do that. Uh, you can use book value, which is the worst way, which, but it's not that uncommon. Uh, you can use a multiple of, of EBITDA. Then you got to define what EBITDA looks like. Uh, you can use, you can use a, a business valuation or frankly, a way to do it. In fact, I've got a case right now where we're doing exactly this. The starting point is, will the part, can the partners agree on what the number is? If they can't agree, and in this particular case, it's an LLC. Dad died, he owned 55%. His estate cannot be a member. They, can, they cannot be, only can be a designee. The company agreement requires him to be bought out, his estate to be bought out. And in the process of buying out his estate, the first process, first step is, can you all agree on a number? If you can't agree on a number, then it goes to mediation. If you can't agree on mediation, in mediation, with a both sides coming up with a valuation by a uh, an, uh, MAI, somebody that's got a certification that knows what they're doing, not just a broker, then if that doesn't match up with a mediation, then they go to arbitration and there's a reasonable probability we'll end up in arbitration on the issue. Wow. Well, as, as, I always, as I always say, try and work out a deal because you can go wind up doing all that and then nobody's happy, right? But the good news is, and frankly, the really, really good thing about this situation is that the dad had the forethought to sit down and say, I want a company agreement and this is what I wanted to say. Without a company agreement and a, and a path, a roadmap, for how to deal with this problem, you'd be in a long-term litigation over a, an amount of money that would never be big enough to justify the law, the, the legal fees in litigation. So wow. he, Dad did a really nice job. Now the estate and the daughters, and maybe they're coming about it a little bit in a way that Dad didn't have in mind. But we've got a process, and we'll get to a solution for sure. Good. We're we're going to talk about that uh, again uh, in a little bit about that uh, making sure your wishes are known. You know, we're we're talking about agreements and things like that. I think handshakes are handshakes are a great way to start a relationship. Uh, of course, pre-COVID, we don't shake anybody's hand now. We elbow bump or whatever it is. But written agreements, in my opinion, minimize future conflicts. Right? You if you can address something in advance, I, I always say that a, an agreement is what you write and it goes into a drawer until there's a disagreement and then you pull out the agreement and you do what it says. So, but handshakes are great. Uh, but I always say that, look, if you've made a commitment, why wouldn't you memorialize it in writing? So what are your thoughts about that? Well, obviously another softball. I couldn't, I can't help but agree with you. And uh, what you'll, what you'll find is that if it's a, a an initial single transaction, like, I'd like to buy 10 bales of hay from you. I'll bring out the trailer. I'll pick them up. You don't need anything in writing for that. On the other hand, if I'm going to plant the hay and we'll split the hay at the end of the day, who's going to pay for the cost of the labor, the fertilizer and whatnot? That's a different deal that ought to at least be in an email that says, yeah, this is what we agree to. Uh, in terms of, of the uh, more detailed agreements, I had a client and it was one of my favorite clients of all time. They ended up selling in 07, sadly for me, but great for him. At my urging, I said, this is a great time to sell. I hate to tell you, but it's a great time to sell. He did, and he did stupendous. But before all that happened, he was in what I called R&D on the fly. And he would have somebody come into his office and say, I'd like to build, I'd like for you to build this unit for me, a radio. And my guy, they would ask my guy, well, how much do you want? Uh, to, for per unit, my guy would say, "Well, for one unit, it'll be a thousand dollars. For a hundred units, it'll be a hundred dollars a piece." Uh, and and my and so what would happen, of course, would be the, the the purchaser would say, "Oh, of course, I want ten units." My guy, in order to get to to be able to purchase to to be able to sell it for the price of a hundred bucks a piece, he would go out and buy a product enough. Uh, materials in order to make a hundred. And of course the guy would buy one or pay for one. And so over time, I said, and then there would be this battle of the forms. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you'd have one guy would send a form, which is a purchase order. Another guy would send a bill of lading. Another guy would send. And before you know it, you have this argument about battle of the forms going back and forth. And each of the forms was unbelievably egregious and made no sense for the other guy who would never have agreed to it if he'd ever picked it up and read the back of it. So in this case, with this client, I said, look, you need to have an agreement, much to your point. 
and the and you just need to have a master services agreement. And if the guy says he's going to buy a hundred units and he's going to and you're going to you're going to charge him ten bucks a unit, then perfect. Put it down in writing. Tell him you're going to be buying this much in materials. And if he doesn't buy all of them, then he's got to buy your inventory back from you. So you're not carrying inventory you're not going to use. Well, believe it or not, he did do that a little, and he only did it because the only other alternative was to sue all of his clients who weren't paying him, to which his response, of course, was, well, it's a small industry. Why, how could I, you expect me to sue my customers and them not get mad at me and the word not get out of the industry? Well, you know, pick one. Go bankrupt because you haven't got any customers or go bankrupt because you got great R, but they're not paying. I mean, whatever you want. So anyway, he ended up with a master with a manufacturing services agreement. And that allowed him both to get his customers to toe the line and be thoughtful about their budgets and their purchases and their POs. And also, which I'd never imagined this to be the case, that was my intended goal. But the, the other thing that came about was bankers were interested in him because he had a written contract with his customers and bankers had, a, particularly those bankers that were uh, asset-based credit uh, uh, customers, they would, they would be able to look at a set of contracts and know and expect that the, that the client, their banking customer, had a chance of getting repaid. And so um, it worked out in, in several different respects. And the client reported to me later that he was able with one client alone to make sure he got paid over a million and a half dollars that he would not have otherwise been paid. So obviously I, I've been too little for his agreement. But, uh, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You don't, you don't get a percentage. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> so, well, you know, I've got another uh, great example of something that I, that I think should have been in writing. You know, as you know, I've done a hundred transactions uh, either as buyer or seller. Most of those I've been the buyer. And one of the things that I always talk with sellers about is what about taking care of your employees? You know, we want them to come on as our employees and we're going to take care of them post-transaction but, you know, have you put anything in place to make sure that your employees get a piece of this transaction or, or something like that to reward them for their hard work? Uh, one example that comes to mind many years ago, I bought a company, we wrote a big uh, seven figure check uh, to, uh, to buy that company. And, and when I'd asked them about, have you, you know, what about taking care of your employees? Do we want some of this to go to the employees? We can take care of that right at closing. You know, we can have all that done. Oh, no, 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 we'll, we'll take care of it. We, we've got something in place. We're going to, we'll take care of them. And the employees, of course, had already intimated that to me. Yeah, they said they're going to take care of us, right? And so we just go on our fat, dumb, happy way, uh, thinking that the employees are taken care of. And about a week after the transaction, uh, uh, I'm in the site and visiting with the employees. and They're mad, almost all of them. I mean, they're just angry. Uh, and I'm like, what, what is going on? And, and individually, one at a time, the management team were coming to me and complaining about uh, what they got you know, from the former owners at the transition. You know, and, and so I went to the former owners and I said, guys, I, I thought you were taking care of them. We did. We took very good care of them. Uh, and I said, well, if you don't mind my asking, you know, what, how much money did you pay out to your management team? And now don't forget, this is a big seven figure check. No, I'm sorry. It was an eight, eight figure check. Sorry, eight figure check. So a solid, you know, tens <laughs> of millions. And uh, they set aside a hundred thousand dollars and broke it up among like 20 employees. So the average employee got, you know, like five grand, right. Um, and most of them less than that. And so now I get into a very uh, close detail. Look, if you, if you make a promise to your employees, that's just an extreme example, right? And it caused us a lot of pain uh, and we had to overcome that uh, long-term. Uh, but, but if you get into agreement, you know, I'm, oh, I hear this all the time. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make him a shareholder. Well, okay. What are the rules around that? And do you have that memorialized? Are you going to, you know, set that up? And, and by the way, you need to probably take care of that long in advance so that, uh, uh, and depending on the structure, it depends on how they're going to be taxed on, on that at the end. But, uh, but to me, if, if you utter the words, I'm going to do this, then why wouldn't you go out and put that in writing? Uh, that just it frustrates the, the fool out of me. Have you seen anything like that with employees? Absolutely. And frankly, from your perspective, you're going to own their problems. 
And it's like you, you're going to own their litigation and you're going to own their employee problems. And if they've made promises to their employees that they didn't keep, well, rest assured, you're going to have disgruntled employees. So if you, don't, if you don't need and you expect to lay off the employees, then it's not a big deal. But if you have plans for those employees to stay around for a while, then, then all of a sudden you own the problem they left behind. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then I, yeah, exactly. I own their problem now. So, so uh, last thing before we, we take a break here is uh, how do you feel about obtaining non-competes, non-solicitation agreements from employees? Well, the first thing I think about that is Texas is different. And, and secondly, I think that if you decide you want one and you're going to go to talk to Mr. Google about getting one, then go ahead and have him prepare a will for you too, because I think it'd be a really bad idea. It'd you mean, be, you mean the Google box is not a good place to go get a legal agreement? <laughs> I, 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 unless it's for, you know, a couple of hundred bucks and one employee, you know, I just, I, I would not recommend it at all. That in Texas, there was a time at, uh, around 2000, 2005, that Texas went through a whole lot of, uh, of, legal challenges and legal precedent, several Supreme Court cases on the issue. What it really boils down to is, if that employee left tomorrow and competed with you, would it be a material difference to your business? Worse yet, and this is probably more problematic, if the employee left tomorrow to form their own business and they started hiring away all your employees because they're a lot nicer to them than you are, there's a, there may be perhaps a lurking issue below that for you. But nonetheless, if they hire, if they're able to hire off all your employees, so you got nobody to work for you and you weren't planning on working beyond another five or 10 years, then that could be even more problematic than a non-compete or your, the solicitation of employees can be more important or problematic than employee leaving and competing with you. So it is something worth talking about. It is something worth looking at. And frankly, if you're looking at selling your business, that can be very important. And back to your point, Tom, uh, about, about running off employees by taking them off. If you're planning on selling your business or having somebody step into your shoes if you die or whatever, become incapacitated, you're going to want somebody around that's motivated to stay and help run the business. If you sell your business, they're going to want the same thing. So that's when you really want to be thoughtful about it. And really the non-compete and non-solicitation with your most important employees like that ought to be tied to some sort of bonus plan or ownership plan or something along those lines that gives them an incentive. And, uh, and frankly, I, I, uh, they they get to share in the benefits and, and the uh, profits of the business makes sense depending upon how important they are to you. Yeah, when I when I get into that conversation with uh, with business owners, the, a common reaction is, "Oh, they're not enforceable anyway." Um, you know, uh, I do know that here in Texas, uh, we are we if they're properly structured and written, you know, they're they are enforceable. Uh, not not true in many other states. I understand that, but uh, but my opinion, I don't think that should prevent you from at least seeking counsel to to understand how do we structure this so that it can be enforceable when the time comes. And I can tell you from my own experience owning businesses here in Texas, I've had to enforce them before and done so successfully. So uh, so it's uh, it can be done for for the business owners that think that you can't do that. So I'm talking. Uh, go ahead. I've done that a number of times myself, and I got folks down the hall. That's all they do day in and day out. So, yes. Oh, right, right. So we're talking to Cleve Clinton. We're going to take a quick break back in 30 seconds. Mastery Partners equips business owners to maximize business value so they can transition on their own terms using our four-step process. We start with a snapshot of where your business is today. Then we help you understand where you want to be and design a custom strategy to get you there. Next, you execute that strategy with the help of our amazing resource network. And ultimately, we help you transition your business on your terms. What are you waiting for? More time? More revenue? If you want to maximize your business value, it takes time. Now is the time. Get started today by checking us out at masterypartners.com or email us at info at masterypartners.com to learn more. 
We're back with Cleve Clinton, an attorney with Gray Reed, and we're talking about legal issues uh, to address while you're maximizing your business value. So before the break, we talked about several legal things that you can do surrounding your employees. Uh, and now that you've protected them and yourself, uh, what do you think about uh, planning for ownership and management transition, Cleve? Well, we kind of alluded to that in the last, my answer to the last question before we took a break, Tom. And, and the, the dilemma that is often faced is that dad doesn't talk about it. And he doesn't have anybody capable of backing him up if he was to become disabled or incapacitated. And frequently, and mom, so I, I'm sorry for those females that might own their business. I'll try to start, I'll try to flip the example the other way for a while. If, if mom owns the business, and particularly a minority owned business often, then uh, what you're, you're faced with is if, if she goes away and there's nobody able to take care of it, often all the assets that the company, that the couple owns are tied up in the business. They may have a little bit of a 401k. They may own some real property. They certainly own their homestead, but by and large, the value of their, their heart, their blood, sweat, tears, and, and equity is all in their business. And so if one of the, one of them, is incapable of running the business, that could be very problematic. So you asked about, so should there, should there be a plan? Yes, there should be somebody that takes care of, there's somebody there that can run the business if the principal owner, if mom cannot. Second, mom or dad should sit down with the kids and say, look, this is what we're gonna do. If when we die, this is the plan. If one of, if one of the kids is gonna run it, this is the plan. This is what we expect of you. I had, a, had a, a good friend, not a client, a good friend. And I said, oh, I said, George, actually, George, I said, uh, so you're, you know, you're getting on up in years and you've got a, you've got a lot of good stuff. Oh yeah, I've got a lawyer. He actually was using a lawyer, a state planning lawyer in San Antonio, I know very well. And he says, yeah, I sat down, I talked to my lawyer and we got it all worked out. I said, well, have you sat down and talked to your kids? Have you explained to your kids what you expect them? She had four daughters. And, she, and he said, nah, nah, I'll let Phyllis take care of that. <laughs> nice. I said, you know, what? The, anyway, they, if, I guess if that's the answer, then there's a whole lot, no, there's very little explanation that'll fix it. Yeah, so, yeah, no, no doubt. The, uh, you know, one of the, one of the issues that I've run across with uh, succession planning is, in fact, it was a, a just an example of what you said: a, a, a female owner, uh, aging, uh, in her seventies. You know, the husband and wife owned it, but she really owned the business, and uh, uh, and they both worked in it. But the intention was to transition. You know, at death, the business basically goes to their to their son that's working in the business. But none of it was documented. There was no plan. There was, and there was a there there was a sister involved in that, not in the business, but. So it just really makes sense to get that kind of stuff cleaned up. And, and by the way, one of the reasons that uh, I, uh, I asked her, I said, why, why haven't you dealt with this? And, and her response um, didn't surprise me, but it was kind of a little bit uh, surprising. She says, well, I, I, I don't want to quit working. Well, it doesn't mean you have to quit working. It means planning for what happens when you don't want to work or, or when worse something happens. I mean, you know, the, if something happened to you, what's going to happen with this business? Uh, you know, what would happen? It would have been in a world of hurt. Now, shockingly, uh, it wasn't my uh, uh, tact and advice that, that solved the problem. It was COVID. Uh, when uh, suddenly she couldn't come to work anymore because she was aging in a risk category. Uh, and then the son had to learn what she did. He had to understand all of that. And she had to teach him basically remotely over the phone in order to do that. And that forced them into going out and memorializing those things. So I really think that dealing with those transition uh, issues in advance just makes good sense. Just like um, uh, the owner making themselves expendable in the business. Do you agree with that, that they should be expendable? Absolutely. I mean, another softball and, and absolutely, I, I, as always, Tom, I agree with you a hundred percent. How could I disagree? I've got, I've got two owners right now. Not well, even, you know, when you're right all the time, right? 
<laughs> well, you know, you, let's just let's just admit it. That this that's just the way it is. Uh, let's admit that that's that's the way. You know, uh, I've got two guys right now, two owners right now. Curiously, not even kind of, uh, motivated by COVID, who are both talking to me and my tax partner, probate estate planning guy, about how to transition their business. One of them has got a, a service business, and he's got he's got two kids. His wife's got two kids. He wants to be equal to all four. However, one of the children, his is active in the business and is ready to run it on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. So we are walking through the process of how can we both on the estate planning side and on the business side, come up with a good handshake between the two businesses to make sure that the company, that the estate works well with the business plan. Uh, the other one is, and much to your point of earlier, has got two children working in the business they're in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. They're doing a great job. So unlike your lady, your 70-year-old lady plus, who's got a son she had to teach over the phone, these two have actually thought through the process. They've sat down with their kids. They're going to tell their kids what they're going to do and what they expect. And it's, that's much to my chagrin, perhaps, I'm doing more and more estate litigation and fighting between families over who gets what. The good news for that family, the bad news for me, perhaps, is that that's not likely that those families are going to fight once dad or mom dies. And that's really the better answer anyway, of course. Yeah. Don't you think, Tom? Wouldn't that be a better answer? Absolutely. Look at that. See, you throw me a softball. I've been throwing you all these softballs, so uh, so maybe I'll throw you a curveball next. <laughs> all right. We'll do it. We'll do it. Well, not really, because it really goes along that line. I think one of the tools that we share with our clients is to be thinking about and documenting and sharing their, what I call their living will, uh, with uh, their business living will, right, with their family and their managers. If something happens to me, this is what I, how my wishes, I want them carried out. Now, of course, that, you know, a lot of that should be documented in the estate uh, documents, but running the business from a day-to-day -day standpoint, you know, this is my my wishes. This is how I want the legacy carried out, that kind of thing. I, I, think, it's, I think it's critical, especially in the case of an, an unforeseen disaster. You know, you know, by definition, you know, an unforeseen disaster can come, you know, at any time. And so, so what do you think about kind of documenting the way you want the business run later and sharing that with employees and family? Well, every well-run business should have its policies and processes documented. Uh, everybody's expendable, even the even the owners. He or she or he or the or the owners are going to be expendable, and they're going to be expendable either because they choose to leave or because, for whatever circumstances, somebody enables them to leave or health-wise are enabled to leave. And so, uh, having a way that the business, in fact. Any successful business is going to have a strategic plan, and it's going to have a tactical plan, and it's going to have a renewable process by which the strategic vision and plan for the company are regularly reviewed, and the tactical points and the priorities are regularly updated to make sure that the business is moving along the right path. For any or all of that to happen, you got to have your policies and your processes at least bullet, note, bullet pointed so that somebody can step in and figure out what needs to be done checklists are great but whatever the process it needs to be memorialized in some fashion that somebody else can step in and pick it up if it's all stuck in your business owner's head then that's a that's a recipe for disaster well that's it and i and i you know not to not to be morbid with our clients but i but i ask them look what happens if you're driving home tonight and you get broadsided by a truck what what happens then uh, and, and many of them, it, many of them uh, get an ashen look on their face and they say, the business will probably go away. Well, is that really what you want to leave to your family, right? Is that, is that the answer that you're looking for? Let's go through a process and document these things. Let's get that stuff out of your head so that it doesn't go away with you. We all have an expiration date. We just don't know what it is yet, right? And so, uh, so. 
what does it do to your 55 or 60 year old husband who's relied upon the cash flow from the business and was expecting to rely upon the cash flow from the business for the next 30 years and now has nothing but social security when they turn 65 in order to be able to, to, to live off of. Yep. So it's not very much planning. No, no. So as we kind of sort of come down the home stretch here, I, I think it's a no brainer. Now, here's the one that you may disagree with me on. I might throw you a curveball here. So I, I think it's a no brainer to settle and avoid kind of lawsuits. Get out of lawsuits. If you're in a lawsuit, get out of a lawsuit. But better yet, it's better to avoid lawsuits to me at all costs. Now, I know that's bad for your business. But do you think it's important to, to kind of a lawsuit avoidance? Lawsuit avoidance, you're, you now put, put the softball back up for me to hit. <laughs> How can I say no to lawsuit avoidance? I mean, that, you're absolutely right on that. However, some folks, and I had a client, great client, also sold out in 2007 for very, very good money, um, who uh, my policy with that client was, I knew where the case was going. I knew whether I could win it or lose it. I knew what the other side might be willing to settle it or not settle it for. And my goal was to get ahead of my client and get to the good result before they jumped in there and paid a lot of money to make it go away. So yes, there are circumstances when you should pay money to go away, but there are also circumstances when you risk overpaying for it. And almost every case, almost every lawsuit has got a path to a resolution. Sometimes the resolution might end up at the courthouse, but you're right, less than 5% of the time should it end up at the courthouse in a, before a judge or jury. But for the other 95% of the time, you're looking at a variety of solutions that could get you to a better result than just throwing money at the problem. Even, believe it or not, avoiding paying a lot of money in, in lawyer fees and spending less money on both the settlement and your lawyer fees than you would otherwise have had to spend. So th there's a variety of paths. Now, but ultimately your question is, should I avoid it? And yes, the best way to avoid it, we'll circle back to your put it in writing. If you've got an agreement in writing and it makes sense, whether it be with your shareholders or your members or your partners in your, in your, your company, or whether it be with your customers or your vendors, having something in writing that says, this is our path to resolution if we want to pick a fight with each other is the best answer to all that. And probably your best answer, I don't care who your lawyer is, doesn't have to be me, but your best answer is probably to look beyond Mr. Google for the right answer or to expect that you know enough to be able to write it down yourself just by yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've uh, worked with people who think of themselves as, uh, you know, Perry Mason uh, and not attorneys, but, but trying to write things and, and, and you know, no, you get, get the qualified person to do that for you. Trust me, it will pay for itself in spades if there's a dispute later. So a quick story, and this could be quick. I had a client who had a friend. He wanted to be a partner. My client fell in love with Zoom. He had 12, he had over a dozen LLCs that he owned 50-50 with his partner. And as you might well imagine, they didn't have a company agreement that addressed what would happen if they came to, to blows with each other. And they did come to blows. The only way to untie that knot, fortunately they were involved in litigation with a third party for other reasons and they were also fighting a little bit with each other. Through the litigation, I was able to force the parties to dissolve all the LLCs. But for that, they would have had to put each LLC into a receivership in order to make them go away. Not a pretty picture. So oh boy. Oh. Zoom and LLCs, you really back to your point earlier, Tom, and it was a well, it was a great point. You need to have a buy-sell agreement in every in every uh, relationship you've got, partnership or otherwise. There needs to be an exit plan that's laid out that makes sense for both parties. I, I totally agree. So, so finally, you know, we also advise our clients that they should, that every business owner should surround him or so, himself or herself with 
what I call a great transition team of advisors that would include a solid business value expert like Mastery Partners, a CPA, a banker, a wealth manager, a state planning attorney, and a general counsel. Um, why is it important to have kind of a complete team to work together as you navigate for the best possible outcome? How do you work with these other professionals? Well, one of the clients I'm working with who is being thoughtful about bringing his two kids on has talked about, we've talked about putting together an advisory board and the advisory board comprises exactly the people that you've identified. And, uh, and that advisory board would be one that would understand the company, would understand the, the ebbs and flows of the company, would be perhaps at least aware of, if not participating in the strategic planning of the company, understand the kids and the other employees and be able to then give insight to the, the primary owner, or in this case, either that or if he dies, his wife in this case, well, they're, I guess maybe they're both primary owners, they own it together. But in any event, to put them in a position to where uh, they've got an advisory board that understands the company well enough to assist the two kids if mom and dad aren't around to help. And, and those people that you identified provide the panoply of services and, and issues that are gonna be addressed by the company on, a, on any kind of an ongoing basis. And so, yes, I think that's a great idea. Uh, frequently in that situation, they're gonna provide counsel that's not gonna be paid for on an hourly basis, but it's gonna be counsel that's gonna be as good or better than you would pay for on an hourly basis. Yeah, whoever else. And I know that you sit on the advisory board of many of your clients, and that's a, I think that's a that's a smart play. I've always had an attorney uh, sit on uh, sit on my advisory board. So, so as we wrap up here, what sets uh, you and Gray Reed apart from other firms? I, personally, I'm relational, and our firm strives to be very relational. We don't we we are transactional if need be. Uh, we get the deal done. We do the M and A. We do the contracts. We sell the the real estate. We all all that is done. We form the entities. My personal interest is more in being the quarterback for all, or perhaps coach for each one of those those uh, specialties, each one of those uh, areas of practice of law that really do have their nuances and their important uh, understanding of non-competes, what's the latest law in non-competes or the latest law in non-solicitations. My role is to be, as I said, the coach, to bring in the right specialties to address the particular situation at hand, and then to understand the other team and understand that the teammates, how they play well with each other, and then communicate that back to the ownership. And of course, you didn't throw in that happy cows give good milk. Yeah, that, that, and frankly, my my folks are happy, and they, the contented cows do give good milk. Contented cows, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the happy cows are the ones that make California cheese, right? <laughs> happy cows are the ones that, who, yeah, exactly. Who knows what they do to the stratosphere or the ozone? <laughs> so, so one last question. This podcast is all about maximizing business value, and we've talked about all kinds of things that business owners should be thinking about. But in your opinion, Cleve, what is the one most important thing that you recommend your, your business owner clients do to build long-term value? Well, it, it, it plays back into what we were talking about, but I'm going to sidestep that for a moment because you've deprived me of one of my favorite questions that I had to spend some time thinking about. Oh, oh no, I've got, I've got, I've got yeah. always, there's always the one bonus question. So I asked, oh, yeah, don't, don't worry. I got a bonus question. <laughs> for the bonus then. Uh, really what I found that's worked out really well and it, it, it's been an interesting dilemma with me and a couple of clients that I have to get to the point of, of making the point. But my position with all my clients has been, look, if you just pick up the phone and let's talk for 15 minutes before you sign that document, who knows what we could have done to have made your life and my life easier because now you're in a position where you're saying, oh, what can I do? Get me out of the mousetrap. And my response would have been, Please don't eat the cheese. Keep, right. your, keep your, 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 your paws off the cheese. So that's perhaps a little bit of a longer way of saying, 
I think that clients should be considering having retainer agreements, having an understanding with a lawyer uh, that is the general counsel type that you've talked about, and, and let the lawyer understand your business. Encourage the lawyer on their own time to come out and spend a day with your business and a day, half a day with each of the principals, which I've done and the COVID has given me that opportunity in the last couple of months. And by doing so, the lawyer understands you and your business, understands where you wanna go and understands where some of your minefields might be so that if you've got a contract to be signed and you, and you say, well, you know, gee, Cleve, would you look at this and spend 15 minutes, spend some time looking at this? And I can say, sure, no problem. That goes on your retainer. And I'm gonna, and I'm, I'm gonna keep track of the time I spend on your retainer matter, but you're not gonna get a bill for it. That's part of your flat monthly fee. And so in doing so, you've kind of prepaid for it. And in knowing that you've prepaid for it, you're a whole lot more willing to give me a call and say, hey, what do you think about this before I sign it? And as you might imagine, as with both me and Tom, if you ask us a question, we've got some ideas on ways that you might look at it that you maybe you hadn't thought of. And, and we Tom, have some stories that we can tell you about reasons why you might want to think about it that way, for sure. Absolutely. And Tom uh, essential at it, as, as you can tell. I am really glad you said that because that to me is, someone taught me that years ago to have your attorney on a retainer. Yeah, we in, in my companies, I've always had an attorney on retainer because to me, it eliminates the question, oh, should I call my attorney? Do I want to get a bill for this? And do I, look, if you're, if you have them for five or 10 or 20 hours a month on retainer, then I always told our people, our, our senior managers who would get into legal agreements uh, with our customers and our vendors and whatnot, I'd say, look, if, if a client sends us an agreement, send it to the attorney. We're already paying for some time. Let's use it, right? And so, uh, so it just it makes sense. It's easy to budget. It's a, it's a smart play. I agree with you completely. And so now we'll get to my bonus question. I always give this after the last question. So, and, and I'll bet I can take a guess at a good one or two for you. But wow. what what personality trait has gotten you into the most trouble over the years? I'm tempted to ask you to answer the question first, but well, I have an answer. So go, but you'd give me yours, and I'll tell. I'll be, I'll be curious to hear yours. Uh, I got to. I have to reluctantly confess, I break the rules. Oh, you break you break the rules, and that gets you into trouble. I do, I do. I break the rules, uh, and, and Frank, I often like to think I use it to my advantage, but but I, you know, I, I'll. I'll I've often been accused of, of breaking too many rules. So anyway, that's a, that's a good one. I was going to say yours would be a lot like mine. And that is, that is um, I, I want to be always be sure that I give a thorough answer. And so I like to talk. Uh, and so uh, people so, tell me sometimes that I talk too much. You know, what, what is that old saying? If I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Well, not me. If I have more time, my letter is going to be 10 times as long, right? Because I want to give you examples and reasons and all of that stuff. So that's... <laughs> it's, like old, it's like the old preacher saying, he was asked to, to deliver a sermon. He says, how much time have I got? And the, and the, the, the guy says, uh, you got an hour. He says, I'm ready now. And then, and then the next guy says, oh, no, no. I want you to preach it in 15 minutes. He said, I'll get back to you next week. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. That's true. That's awesome. So how can our uh, viewers and listeners get in touch with you, Cleve? Uh, there's a couple of ways. Grayreed.com, G-R-A-Y-R-E-E-D.com is where I reside with my firm. Tiltingthescales.com is a blog that I do that is intended to be business issues with a with a legal slant. And more and more, it's looking at issues that affect families and their businesses in transition, which is kind of, my, all of my mavericks are getting older. And as they get older, they're thinking or should be thinking about their businesses and their families in transition. And so that's become the focal point of a lot of what I do. And then finally, uh, C. Clinton at Gray, G-R-A-Y, read, R-E-E-D.com. C. Clinton at Gray, read.com is, that's me. And um, for now, I would encourage anybody that's watching to now's a good time to sit back and think, 
where am I with my business? Where do I want it to go? And if you're interested in talking about uh, what COVID has done to you and what impact it's made, give Tom or me a call. We'd love to talk to you about it because frankly, we're, we're very interested in you and your business. And we're particularly interested in knowing how you might have pivoted and turned in order to deal with the, the curveballs that, uh, that COVID-19 has thrown your business in the last six months. I but would would I you agree? Have I, have I spoken out of school, Tom? Uh, that, I, I, you yeah, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. We, we are very, both of us are very passionate about business owners and, and helping them to, to uh, survive and, and thrive even during times like this. So, hey, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Cleve, for being our guest today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy uh, it. Too. You can find Cleve at grayreed.com, G-R-A-Y-R-E-E-D.com, or on LinkedIn. And of course, uh, if you have trouble finding him, just reach out to me. I will connect you. This is Maximize Business Value Podcast, where we give practical advice to business owners on how to build long-term sustainable value in your business, even during challenging times like these. Be sure to tune in each week and follow us wherever you found this podcast. And be sure to comment. We love your comments and we respond to all of them. So until next time, I'm Tom Bronson reminding you to protect yourself and your employees and your business legally while you maximize business value. Thank you for tuning in to the Maximize Business Value podcast with Tom Bronson. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition on their own terms. Our mission was born from the lessons we've learned from over 100 business transactions, which fuels our desire to share our experiences and wisdom so you can succeed. Learn more on how to build long-term, sustainable business value and get free value-building tools by visiting our website, www.masterypartners.com. That's mastery with a Y, masterypartners.com. Check it out. That was perfect. I wouldn't make any changes on that.